Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us from all over the world. Thank you for joining us today to talk about how innovation is applied to the mining sector to increase efficiency and productivity. My name is Bettina Venner, and I manage the Industry Capability Network in the Department for Trade and Investment. ICN builds supply chains for major projects and connects local suppliers to opportunities. I'll be your facilitator for today's webinar. When we've heard from each of our guest speakers, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. Please ask our speakers your burning questions via the Q&A box on your screen. Now, a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Firstly, please know that this webinar will be recorded and this will allow those who have missed the webinar to watch it at a later date. The recording will be uploaded to the Department for Trade and Investments website. And secondly, there will be a poll which will pop up on your screens at the end of the webinar, which will allow you to provide any feedback you may have. All feedback is welcome and encouraged. I'd like to now introduce our first speaker, Matthew Stead from Ping Services. Matthew is the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Ping Services, an intelligent listening company. He has a Bachelor of Engineering and a Master's of Engineering Science qualifications with nearly 30 years experience in acoustics, including research in wind farm acoustics and environmental noise. In 2018, he founded Ping Services to help wind farms reduce blade maintenance costs by detecting damage using sound. Matthew's presentation will follow after a short video about Ping Services, which will be shown now. As part of the transition to a renewable future, there's push to build bigger wind turbines and generate more renewable energy. But this comes with a greater risk of wind turbine blade damage. So Ping Monitor is helping to solve that problem. We've created a world first plug and play device that attaches simply to the base of the wind turbine to monitor the health of the wind turbine blades. Using our proprietary acoustic based data analytics, Ping continuously measures sound from the blades before communicating using our IoT technology. And this alerts the staff to any damage. For the operator, this has several benefits. It improves preventative maintenance, reduces cost, and maintains power generation output. Our product is also easy to install, simple to operate and maintain, and is powered by the sun with a backup lithium ion battery. Ping currently services wind farm operators across the globe with customers in Australia, the US and Europe. And we're proud to have received several awards for our innovative Ping Monitor product. Please contact us to learn more about Ping and to see how it can help change the future of renewable energy for your business. Thank you, um, Bettina, and um, um, great to be here. I really appreciate the, the invitation. So I, I do actually have a, a brief presentation which I'll run through and I'll provide a bit more detail um, in addition to um, what we've just um, seen just then. As you can see, wind turbines are amazing generators of power, but they do need blade maintenance. Here's an example of obviously one of the wind turbines where things haven't quite gone right. And a bit of context, these blades are made of fiberglass, so they tend to be uh, prone to damage from um, hail, lightning strikes, and, and so forth. And the tip speed can be up to 300 kilometers per hour. So while they appear to be rotating very slowly, um, they can be quite highly stressed. And as I uh, said in the intro video, um, the blades are getting longer and longer and longer as they're generating more and more power. The other thing that is occurring at the same time is that you know, the factors of safety are reducing because the de design efficiencies are in increasing. So some of the original blade designs were very conservative, whereas now um, they're becoming more optimised and there's more risk of um, blade damage. So you can see, you know, blades over 50 metres long are uh, almost um, are very common now and they're the longest blade in the world now is something like 117 metres with um, longer blades planned. And from a materials point of view, bigger blades are also much harder to test. So this means there's increased risk um, from the design um, process and which can't always be ironed out through the, the testing phase. So there's increased risks. This combined with the increase in number of wind turbines around, uh, around the world 
means that there's more and more um, investment in wind turbine blade maintenance. And what this means is there's also a very large opportunity to optimize this process. So at Ping Monitor, as I said before in the opening video, we're an intelligent listening business. And we were started, well actually the idea was started six years ago when we were challenged by a wind farm operator and the operator said to us that his technicians could hear when there was wind turbine blade damage and why couldn't we make a machine that could also listen for wind turbine blade damage. And the whole concept is that uh, damage on a blade disturbs the airflow and creates sound. And here's our first proof of concept way back from that initial idea. So these are the real acoustic signals. These have been measured from two turbines under exactly the same conditions. So two turbines, same wind speed, same orientation and so forth. The green one has no major damage, but the red one has damage at the end of one of the tips uh, around 20 millimeters in size. So you can see a very small damage on one of the tips of the blades can make quite a significant difference to the acoustic signature. And that's uh, in essence what we're listening for. So we've got um, a variety of algorithms listening for this wind turbine blade damage. And the reason why sound is important is because it can be deployed continuously. The current methods of inspection of wind turbine blades are all periodic. And what this means is they're all based on visual inspection and hence because they're visual and highly manual, they can only be carried out periodically. So what can happen is, you know, blades can be inspected today, but there can be a storm tomorrow and a lightning strike tomorrow, which might not be picked up for 12 or 24 or 36 months. So it can be quite a time between visual inspections because they are quite expensive. So our system being um, cost effective and continuous provides an early warning system for the wind turbine blades. And the benefit comes from you know, three main areas. The first area, earlier detection of damage allows earlier repair, which means repair when it's smaller and cheaper. So that's the first thing. The second thing is with our early warning sort of detection, we can optimize the visual inspection process. So there's no real need to inspect wind turbine blades if there's actually nothing wrong. So there can be optimized there. And then thirdly, with an overall optimized maintenance regime, more power is generated. So that's the third area where there's benefit. So we've created the ping monitor to be located at the base of each wind turbine. And you can see the example here that's simulating some sound being propagated from a damaged blade and that propagates down to our, our sensor, uh, which we pick up, we analyze on our device and then communicate to our, our cloud service. And this is what it looks like a bit closer up. In the opening video, you saw them being installed and you can see how quick it was, so less than five minutes. So very uh, quick and efficient and probably importantly, um, our systems are designed so they don't need specialist technician installation. So there's no power wiring or communications wiring or drilling or anything like that. So quite a quick and efficient installation um, process. All of uh, the algorithms um, outcomes get transmitted to our cloud and then we're able to have our customers monitor the conditions of their blades through the cloud system. So if it, something changes, um, they can they can address it after getting this daily feedback. There's a little bit of um, um, fluctuation in this and it's largely due to wind speed and direction, which is obviously always changing. Um, and our algorithms are continually improving to, to smooth out some of these environmental effects. So far, we've um, demonstrated this on over 300 wind turbines around the world. So we've got current installations in uh, Germany, um, UK, uh, US and obviously Australia. Uh, so the, the nice thing is that generally, you know, a wind turbine of the same make and model in Australia is the same as the same make and model in the US or Germany or whatever. 
uh, but we have tested on a variety of um, ages, a um, variety of terrains, you know, on hills um, next to the coast and um, so forth with a range of blade lengths and um, a range of OEMs. So what the figure is showing is each dot is a wind turbine and it's showing the correlation between what the visual inspection says and what our, our system says. So we're, we're pretty happy with this correlation. And the key takeaway here is that we're not really showing false positives or false negatives, which scare a lot of, um, a lot of our customers. So this is where I, I change my uh, talk a little bit. So um, you probably heard that you know, we base our system on the analogy of, of a technician. And you know, if tech technicians can hear things going on with machines and machinery and um, you know, assets, um, we can you know, apply our device to listening for those same assets. So there are many examples where technicians walk around sites listening for damage from um, you know, the, listening for the health of machinery. And so our, our logic is that we essentially provide a technician 24 seven, um, rather than just having a, a walk, walk by or a pass by. So there's a whole range of uh, applications beyond wind. While I've gone into wind in a fair bit of detail, um, there's a whole lot of detail I can go into for other industries as well, which we're, we're moving to you know, in the future. And one of those probably key examples is uh, conveyor belt idlers and idler bearings. So sound is a great way of measuring the health of these because sound can be used to measure uh, the health of multiple bearings, multiple idlers, multiple systems at once. Whereas if you use vibration, you really need to be measuring on each individual um, you know, bearing. So that's why sound is a really good uh, application uh, for conveyor belts uh, and is uh, we can essentially reuse our existing uh, technology, our existing communications, our existing solar panels, our existing sensor in these applications. Another very obvious one um, is uh, wagon wheel bearings and wheels and um, as, as per the conveyor belt, uh, it's been shown that uh, bearings as they age um, generate a whole range of things. And at one point, um, you know, around about uh, perhaps a little bit after they generate vibration, but they um, start generating sound. And so we can listen to those sounds um, and use algorithms to you know, alert on the bearings and the, the, the wheel conditions. So this is another future application that um, we're moving to in the future. So that, that's the end of my brief talk. Um, so just a, a couple of quick ones. Um, I do have um, some of the technology here, so I can I can do that. I got some show and tell, and perhaps a little bit of context on our business. So, you know, while the idea started six years ago, um, really we're two two and a half years old. Um, we've got ten people, um, all based in Adelaide and we're working with um, customers um, all over the world. So most of our pr product is manufactured in Adelaide, but we source components from, from all over. Um, but I'm happy to answer additional questions later on. Bettina, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Matthew. And that was really good and made me think about what other applications, and I think you then got to it with the mining applications, the rail car. Um, this morning alone, I was driving, um, you know, traveling to work and there was a bit of a noise in the vehicle and yeah, the noise does give us a warning sign, there's some issues. So those issues were addressed. Um, so we'll uh, get to questions um, at, at the end. And so just a reminder to please pop those questions in the Q&A box. Now we'll move on to our second speaker, Paul Figalo. He's the Group Business Manager of Novafast Holdings. Paul's career with Novafast Holdings spans over 20 years and he's currently responsible for the group's business growth and daily operations. He has established the international business expansion plan for the group, including setting up offshore offices in Malaysia and a network of international distributors and suppliers around the world. His responsibilities have included international business trading arrangements and he has a good cultural understanding of international business, having negotiated trade project and supplier contracts in overseas markets across the globe. Paul's presentation will follow after a short video about Nova Fast Holdings, which will be shown now. 
Hi, I'm Paul Figolo, Group Business Manager at Novafast Holdings. Novafast Holdings is a family business started back in 1999. Today we continue to offer specially engineered solutions for sophisticated projects. Our services include design, testing, manufacturing and installation of advanced engineering systems. Based in Adelaide, our engineering and service facilities includes a 7,000 square metre undercover manufacturing and service warehouse equipped with advanced machinery. Our growing capability allows us to handle large scale projects for national and international markets. Our head office also houses a unique testing facility for project management and engineering governance for ongoing improvement. What sets us apart from our competitors is we offer this from one centralised South Australian location. Novafast Holdings has a vast national and international experience in major industry sectors such as oil and gas, mining, water and defence. Our products are suited to a wide range of various engineering processes such as piping and containment systems. Detailed planning ensures our products are designed to deliver maximum asset lifespans with minimum maintenance requirements in the harshest of environments. As a South Australian owned business, we have established international trading subsidiaries and plan to expand our footprint further. At the root of our international capability is our South Australian research and development, where our innovative materials are developed and engineered as Australian owned intellectual property. Our products are developed and tested in Australia against international certification programs and used in some of the world's most demanding locations. Our complete services provide full turnkey systems for clients. We are a single point of responsibility for engineering solutions. We offer constant industry evaluation and innovation with safety first mentality and have proudly worked with some of the top global names across all industry sectors. Contact Novafast Holdings to find out how our specialised engineering solutions can assist your business. Thank you, Bettina, and thank you for the Department of Trade and Investment for letting me speak today. And thank you for the listeners that have attended. Um, so I'll just start a presentation that I've prepared. So I'm going to give you a background uh, on our group. So I'm going to make the presentation a little bit different. So for us, we've been around for 20 years and our, our business journey has been an exciting one. Um, we're in a growing sector, but our challenges were we wanted to be an international business. So how do we actually compete with low cost countries? I'm gonna explain that today. Um, low cost manufacturing comes with low value product. Is that the right thinking for us in Australia? Uh, what are the barrier to entries for an international market? And is it really price that our clients are after? Um, commodity versus bespoke, those industries in Australia are very different. I mean, our economic size is uh, very different to the rest of the world. Um, and what is our global point of difference? So. Over our 20 year journey, like many businesses, we've chopped and changed. So I'm going to address some of these points today. So yes, as the video said, we're located out of Adelaide. Um, that's been our whole history. So we specialize um, in engineering companies. So we, have a, we are a group of companies. We specialize in composite products. Uh, we work in all sectors in advanced engineering materials and we work in, uh, like I said, in the global market is our vision. So who are we? So Novafast Holdings is actually a, a, a conglomerate of three Australian brands that have come together over 20 years. So Basetech Services is our original brand and that was a traditional construction company in Australia. Dennis Sutherman Associates is our consulting and engineering company that merged and provides a lot of the um, intellectual smarts of the business today. And then Novafast itself is actually our registered international trademark. And it's the Novafast brand that we've carried through to centralised incorporator under Novafast Holdings. So over our journey, um, we have uh, operated around the world, but we've always come back to our head base in Adelaide. So our head central location and investing in Adelaide has been a big part of our growth. So currently we have moved into a facility that is currently uh, undergoing upgrades. Uh, we're currently in that facility and have been for the last two years. Uh, as the business grows, the facility allows us to grow with it. Um, and we're investing in uh, new technology, new machinery at the moment. So we believe this is very important uh, for South Australia because our, we want to be competing on a, with a global audience and we want our presentation to be at that level. So all businesses have health, safety and environmental regulations, but the importance and one of our lessons learned from our early days was we were very Australian focused. Everything we did had reference to an Australian standard or a British standard, which is traditionally our background. So one of the things we had to uh, embrace was international standards, which are more regularly recognised by the world. 
by embracing international standards, it's allowed us to go easily into those other markets. So our engagement throughout, the, throughout our 20 years has been in all those countries that you can see. So we've worked there either on projects with suppliers um, or board equipment directly. So I have specifically worked a lot, as the video said, through Southeast Asia and recently a lot more through the Middle East region. Some of our current customers over the years, Australia and international, um, are some big blue chip clients. So we're working with the likes of Chevron, uh, Bechtel's, Santos, the big oil and gas players, and in mining as well. Now, these companies demand continual improvement. And that's one thing that it took us a long time to recognise. So we lifted our eyes and, and decided to go through blue chip and tier one type companies. And we said that our business has to align and be attractive to invest, uh, to attract those types of companies. So the other key to success is that we have to make sure that what our service offering is uh, internationally is that we're in a growing market and not a declining market. So we specialise in composite materials and that is growing by the year um, at quite a fast rate. So um, traditional materials like steels and metallics uh, have been traditionally used but slowly being uh, replaced by composites and the market is growing at a fast rate. The growing sectors for us, we work across, we're quite diverse. Um, our products are used in oil and gas, where we provide piping for flow lines, for water transfer lines, uh, for water and wastewater, for infrastructure, we provide sewage pipelines, we provide water pipelines, high pressure. Um, for mining and industrial, we provide acid plant, acid transfer pipelines. For defence and marine, it's ballast, it's seawater transfer uh, lines within ships. Uh, that's, that's how diverse piping is used for everything. So again, what took us a long time to understand our point of difference was how can we in Australia compete with the likes of India and China? In the early days, we, we were importing heavily from overseas ourselves. We were investing overseas to manufacture. What we've noticed recently is that uh, it's not actually the product the clients want in our, in our sector. They actually are after the technological input and the research and development into the product first. So, probably five years ago, our whole vision really started to shift back into investing back into Australia, put the Australian element into the products, give the credibility that the clients want and actually invest back into advanced manufacturing. So we're currently rolling out a multi-million dollar equipment expansion and that's currently happening now and will be happening to the next six, uh, the next six months of next year. But we don't want that to ever stop. We always want to be improving in this area because it's efficiency and it's how we reduce our, um, it's how we compete with low cost labor countries. So the product, we sat down and said, okay, we have a range of products and services and engineering, but our real point of difference is our Australian engineering credibility. The staff I have, uh, I've graduated traditionally in a university around Australia. We have uh, numerous engineers, but we've found that Solution, providing solutions to clients, uh, working with the universities and, and understanding uh, that point of difference is again, what uh, big blue chip clients are after. What they want is the credibility of the actual product itself generated in the design concept. And we believe this has been a big part of our success recently. Uh, and we want to keep investing heavily in the engineering team. The other challenge for us was when we first started uh, years ago is we wanted to do everything. We wanted to go overseas and actually install the work as well, install our products. But then we realised that we had to pull down that barrier to entry and we had to um, work with local industry. Like all countries, even Australia, everyone has local participation policies for their own people. So one of the uh, other drivers for us was creating an Australian accredited composite training course that's certified. That course allows us to train local installers and local applicators of our product. That has actually helped us sell more material than we realised. We were actually focusing on trying to do too much, which was actually um, reducing our, um, our sale ability. Same with the traditional service work, where uh, our group was being the hands-on people. We wanted to control as much as we could. What we do now is we work internationally with contractors. We license contractors in their countries. We provide designs and we provide um, product uh, as we need. But we found that just supervising um, and working with their people has, has opened our market up quite a fair bit. 
So I'm just going to take you through some case studies of some of our, uh, this, these case studies would be very, uh, very recent. So this project was in Malaysia. This was, was completed, I think, two years ago. Um, it was for Petronas. Uh, the challenge of this one, this was on Borneo Island. Again, so this was the first time that we really worked with a local workforce um, to install our products. And all we had to do was send our supervisors over there to manage the program. We found it actually worked very well. The case studies also relate back to our own backyard, South Australia. So South Australia, BHP has had a long, a long history here for, uh, basically we've worked there for throughout our 20 year history. Now, that's a big refinery and acid plant that they have up uh, at Olympic Dam in South Australia. Our equipment has been used extensively throughout the harshest environments in that plant. And we use that as references for international uh, growth. So it's very important that people understand we do do it in South Australia as well. More international case studies, um, Kuwait oil, we worked uh, in, uh, on a big project over there. Again, most of our, uh, the smarts came out of Australia. So the design element was controlled out of the Adelaide office. But when it comes to the execution and the product, we worked with the local uh, Q8 suppliers. We worked with local Q8 contractors to actually um, deliver the project. And again, we found uh, the fact that we were able to open up the barriers to our business, it actually um, entrenched us further into the project. Same in Western Australia. So we're working with US companies, Bechtel and Chevron, and they're very demanding if you work uh, with US blue chip clients. Uh, this project was a 50 billion oil and gas project. Um, it was traditionally built in metallic piping and it was only a few years old. What happened on this project was we were called in at the back end to replace the traditional metallic piping processes and, um, and swap them out with our own composite materials. So we had to work in a live refinery, uh, which was very uh, unique uh, with, whilst the plant was maintained and running. So New Zealand, we've worked on geothermal. So the, again, sea, uh, uh, geothermal cooling water systems is what it's used for. It's used for power stations. And you'll see the products are used um, for big, large diameter pump casings. We also work in uh, Papua New Guinea. So we're quite diverse. So again, it's service work in this instance. We control design element from our Adelaide office, but a part of working on that plant requires that we have local engagement. That local engagement is directly employed through us and that's constant training that we must provide to those local people to upskill them. And but by doing that, it's increased the amount of work for our own business. So at the end of all of this, the key for us that we've learned in the last 10 years is when I've traveled the world a fair bit, is it still comes down to people and relationships. Um, technology is what people want. They like Australian credibility. Um, part of our, uh, our nature and our culture is very friendly. So getting in front of these people has, has worked for us. Thank you. No worries. Thank you for that, Paul. That's great. Um, and thank you for sharing some of those learnings of um, following the customer, understanding the customer's needs and understanding those unique points of difference in the markets to enable you to expand what you supply to those markets. So I'll invite now any questions from the audience and remember that Q&A box on your screen. And if we don't get to all your questions, we'll be able to follow up on these with you one on one. Now, let's have a look at those questions. So, first question, I guess, is for Matthew. You're a relatively um, new company. Are you looking for sales agents in overseas markets? Uh, yes, actually, yeah. we had a board meeting this morning and approved um, the fact that we will be looking for sales agents. Um, our, our initial focus uh, is in the United States and also Germany. Um, uh, our system uses uh, cellular communication and um, this is what look this is the comms unit and uh, we've established in Germany and the United States it doesn't need to be modified so that's um, our initial uh, focus for sales agents. Okay. Great thank you for that Matthew and then I guess um, Paul are you looking for any sales agents in new markets? Yes absolutely so uh, very similar to Matthew part of our growth strategy plan is uh, to have uh, authorised distributors throughout the world. So we have uh, distributors in Malaysia and in Oman that's been really successful for us. And we've found that that's definitely what we're after to get the to break into the market with a partner first. Great, so those sales agents are welcome to contact us through the Department for Trade and Investment and I'll include contact details for my colleague Chris Lim 
after the presentation or they can probably contact you directly via LinkedIn as well. Matthew, this is a bit of a technical question. How is sound different to vibration? Because you're monitoring sound and how does your, um, your um, ping monitor not listen to the sound of the, um, the wind farm or, or the wind tower, the adjacent wind tower? Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, we we often get asked this question, and um, so you know, sound and vibration are quite different. Um, as in, sound is really the um, movement of air particles, whereas vibration is really the movement of structures. So um, we listen to the sound which is travelling through the air from the blade, and so we're essentially listening for sound. Um, there is always sound in structures as well. So if you put your ear to a mechanical structure, you'll hear a lot more sound than you would um, than you might in the open air. Um, and we've got some techniques for excluding, actually you know, rejecting rejecting the vibration um, and the sound from the vibration because um, we're interested in the blade, not not the mechanical at the moment. Um, so the second part of the question was around how do we uh, listen for or not listen for the adjacent turbines <laughs> um, um, and that, that's that's really a factor of distance um, you know turbines are you know located x you know distance apart and you know typically the adjacent wind turbines are so far away that the turbine that we're listening to directly is way louder than the neighboring ones so that, that's how we get around that one um, so we had a little case study in the United States where um, a wind turbine we weren't measuring on actually lost part of a blade. <laughs> and so we, we really wanted to be able to hear it. Um, so we went through all the data and it didn't show up in the data. So <laughs> that was right. a perfect case if we'd heard this blade you know, flying off, but we didn't. And that was because we weren't measuring on that tower. That makes sense, cool, thank you. Okay, now, um, Paul, a question for you, um, and this one specifically around the Middle East, and what did you learn from doing business in that region? Uh, yes, it was very tough initially. So um, stature is quite important in the Middle East, for, and for us in Australia, that's uh, um, it's quite foreign. So what I found was uh, their titles uh, were quite meaningful. So to have general management and executive manager present to them uh, is an important aspect of it to present your business as being um, friendly and open for business is important um, and actually really just going over there and letting them evaluate you yourself so getting me myself getting in front of them I found that yes letting them break me down was more important than the actual business and, and I, f I found that in the Middle East and in Asia it's very similar that they want to get to know you first they have to trust you uh, and that does take time, uh, which for us was frustrating initially um, because we, we're impatient in Australia. We, we, we know what we, we're confident in what we do, but we find it uh, difficult to, especially when it's um, in different jurisdictions, to take you know, time for those relationships to flounder. But once we've been doing that, we find that um, it's grown the work. So, And your word is everything. If you, if you don't follow through in your word, it's more, it's more important than the actual business name itself, the, the engaging people. Great, thank you. Um, and I guess that's probably true of, of some other markets as well, the, the real value of relationships. Um, which brings me to the next question. Um, how have the COVID restrictions impacted on your ability to continue to build those relationships? Or have you used other means of continuing to maintain and build on those relationships? Uh, yes, that's been very difficult. So business development naturally, you can host uh, engineering seminars and project management meetings. Uh, it is something I struggle with personally. I have found that uh, this technology is definitely helping because on the flip side, you can cover a lot, a lot more meetings quicker. Um, but uh, it is something we have struggled with. Um, to open up the world, we're looking forward to it. Back on the plane and engage face to face. Um, I suppose that's just the a cultural shift for our own business as well to adapt and embrace it. Um, but there's nothing like touch and feel in my opinion. I know that's uh, there's a lot of positives, but yet we have, I have found that hard to be honest. Yeah, no, that's understandable. And I guess that's one of the reasons why our department's also hosting webinars such as this one today, so they can get to know you and then continue building on that relationship. Um, there's another question here. What's the largest diameter piping that you can um, provide? 
So piping networks, if it's low pressure, it could be up to two meters in diameter. We're doing a low pressure, which is what they refer to gravity and that's in sewer. Um, but our point of difference is really our high pressure pipe, which goes up to about uh, 900 millimeters. So high pressure is traditionally competing with the metallic steel piping in process pipelines. So um, we're not the traditional plastic transfer pipeline company that's low pressure. Uh, we, we, uh, we really deal in high pressures in oil and gas and mining and water. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, now, Matthew, you alluded to some potential applications for your device. Do you want to elaborate on any of those? Are you ready to elaborate on any of those? Yeah, I think um, we are starting um, a pilot with uh, Oz Minerals. They, they announced it publicly um, last week. Um, so we're starting a pilot of measuring on some conveyor belts, so measuring the idler bearings and the, the condition of conveyors, and um, that's probably our next area that, that we're going to. Um, so that, that's beyond wind. Um, we also, there are some quite strange applications inside wind as well. So in the Northern Hemisphere, when blades ice up, because they, they, they're in cold climates, they ice up, and so we can uh, listen for ice on blades as well. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I, I guess what we are doing is we're setting ourselves uh, up and we have set ourselves up to, you know, apply this, which is our you know, intelligent listening sensor. We, we can apply this to multiple industries, like, like we said. Um, so this is quite a cost effective way of you know, continuously monitoring. Um, and this, this device in, incorporates our, our microphones, incorporates our microcontroller, our memory. And so I'm, I'm very proud of what we've achieved with this little guy. And, and to be able to you know, put our logo on it, I'm pretty thrilled. Wow, <laughs> cool. Um, now, I guess the next question, um, Paul, is for you. So, Southeast Asia is a market you've mentioned you are um, in. How do you believe other South Australian companies can enter that market? Any, any suggestions, any tips? Uh, like I said, we started with distributors, uh, and we found that building relationship and setting um, business goals with the distributor before you basically jump too far in with, into a business arrangement with them, see if the relationship works, let them meet uh, objectives. And then as it does the relationship, they sort of pull you into the business. And then once you've built up um, some initial sales and some execution projects, then yeah, it, it's naturally now taking a business plan. Uh, it takes its own path where we were able to set up an office and, and then start to pursue that local market. Uh, we were hesitant at the start to just go there because of the mainly because of the local culture around the business ownership engagement um, being 51% in that country. And so releasing control of the business was something that was not something we wanted to do straight away. Uh, we, we would only do that with time. So uh, that, that's a bad thing. So, so there are quite a few steps in the process and it, it takes time. No, yes, right. in Southeast Asia it does, yeah. Yeah. And um, Paul, I, I, this question is for you as well. What's special about um, international markets being interested in Australian products? So, so what makes the Australian products so special uh, it's, and Australian it's, businesses? It's like Matthew's pointed out with his product. So it's the credibility and the tech, yep. the engineering behind it, which is, and all of that's generated from our universities. That, that's why we're so dependent on our education system because that's what we're actually offering to the world. The product is just the result of that tech, of that learning system and our, and our whole lifestyle. And that took us a long time to understand because we were wanting to shove the product down people's throats, but they actually, all they wanted to understand was how do you actually control the process? And, and once we started selling the engineering side of it, that, the product just comes with it. And I'm sure that the universities would be very happy to speak to any companies that might be listening in at the moment and um, wanting some more connections there as well. Um, it looks like we have come to the end of our questions. I'll just double check that quickly. Yep. Okay. It looks like we've come to the end of our questions. So thank you very much to our speakers, Matthew and Paul, who have led an engaging discussion this afternoon. It's certainly a lot to take away from today. If you haven't already, I encourage you to register for the next METS webinar, which will be tomorrow. The topic is AI and mining, the new world. So tomorrow, Thursday, 10 December at 4 p.m. Australian Central Daylight Time. During the next webinar, you'll hear about how mining operations integrate AI to achieve successful outcomes. 
So that concludes today's webinar. Remember to stay online briefly to fill in our short survey. And the conversation doesn't have to end there. Feel free to reach out to my colleague Chris Lim, Business Development Manager, Minerals and Mets within the Department for Trade and Investment. He's here to assist you and his details are listed on the closing slide. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Right. See ya.